you're sitting on properties, now to come back to this, if you're sitting on properties and you think that you from central control are, are engineering community by putting a, a kitchen or, a, or a, work, a workout facility and hosting a couple of events, you can see the difference there between what you're doing and what real movement, community growth, loyalty connection and is really looking like. And it's really more about evangelization. I just throw that out there too. One of the things I'm going to do is put up a slide at the end and say if there's anybody who's interested in following up with me on a few topics, this is something I'd like to crack the code of. I want to try to figure out how we could create a movement of residential housing where community came to life, where people actually felt that a group of individuals that I cohabitate around have my back. And it's not real estate baiting. It's a different way of thinking. So I throw that out there to you as something we could discuss as a follow-on for this. But that's, that's, what this, that's the conversation here that I wanted to have um, around community and Never Eat Alone and the evolution of that. Now, let me talk a little bit about you and your offices and your leadership. I, I spent 10 years researching. If you, think about, if you think about leadership, how does a guy who wrote a book about networking, who was a marketing and sales guy, show up today coaching some of the most prominent leadership teams in the world and the answer is, I realized that teams are now networks, not org charts. I'll explain what I mean by that. If you really, I don't know how big your organizations are, but even a small organization, a family office, your work has nothing to do with who reports to you. Your work has to do with your ability to organize, manage a co-elevating group of people sharing a, a similar mission, which is a goal of getting something done a property that you may be engineering or building or developing, there is an entire ecosystem of people, some of whom you pay, some of your partners, some of them whom work for you as W-2s. All of those individuals are critical to that success. Your ability to lead that ecosystem is leadership today. And it's really going back to the principle that I left for you early on, which is you're showing up. When a group of people don't report to you, when you can't just point to them and tell them what to do, then how do you create how do you create shared, aligned you know, ideas of how we're getting things done? And it's really the same principles of generosity, of authenticity, creating followership. Now, if you're a CFO in a large organization, I have seen CFOs in organizations be the tipping point of organizational and business transformation. I've been writing a lot about this. I've seen CFOs partner with CIOs to be the culture change agent of organizations. Now, that sounds a little odd. What two titles would be the least likely culture change agents of a company? CIOs and CFOs. But if you get the CIO and the CFO stepping in and saying, let's figure out how we're going to reboot the way we work as a company. Let's figure out how we're going to be digitally forward in our collaboration. Let's figure out how we're going to fundamentally transform accountability, candor, transparency, collaboration. All of these things are going to be redesigned through technology forward and in the process we're going to be much more efficient than we ever were. We're going to have faster decision making. Take one process to re-engineer business planning. It's a process that touches everybody. If you could fundamentally re-engineer business planning to reboot the culture of a company, to be more transparent, more psychologically safe, more bold, et cetera, it could be game changing. And I've been studying organizations like American Airlines where just that happened. The CFO and the CIO together changed the culture of the company. My point to you is, who is the agent of transformation in any of your organizations? It's only you, any of you. And then as a leader, how do you get the people in your organization to be the change agent of your organization? It's how you lead. And the difference between traditional leadership and what I'm talking about is that we have over-indexed on a form of leadership that is Jack Welsh leadership, which puts you as a leader at the hub and spoke of all change. It puts you as the individual directing other individuals. And so the idea of team has to do with org chart, where the idea of team has to do with authority, has to do with control. The reality is that we have over-indexed on leadership and significantly under-indexed on teamship. I'll give you an example. A great leader, a great leader doesn't think about how they give good feedback. A great leader thinks about how do you get your team to give each other feedback. And on average, we do a lot of diagnostics with teams. On a scale of zero to five, teams are only 2.4 in terms of their ability to have candor and transparency in the room when it's risky. Teams are only 1.9 
in their ability to believe that they can give feedback to their peers. That is mediocre leadership in its utmost. But yet, it's across the board of what all teams are. You've, you, we have a social contract today in teams that's hub and spoke to you. And when I work, I've worked in a, um, until the war in the Ukraine, I was coaching for many years one of the finance teams of one of the biggest oligarchs in Russia. So, think command and control? Yeah. And what we were able to do, this wasn't with the oligarch wasn't the head of the team, this was the finance organization, the investment organization of the group. What we, and was very hub and spoke, very command and control, very authoritative, etc. And the finance leader was desirous of a different set of outcomes, was very pissed off that people weren't taking more initiative, very pissed off that people weren't um, being more bold, very pissed off that he was always at the center of decision making. And whose responsibility, who created that social contract? He did. He created all of that social contract. And so we started adopting practices that started to shift him out of the center and to started opening up the team to give each other feedback, to give each other coaching. And you're right, many of you may be sitting back as leaders and think, you know what, I've got to be at the center because my team just doesn't have, the oomph doesn't have the, the capability of doing what I can do. Well, there's two things around that. Number one is you engineered that. What you did is you hired a group of people who are leveraged to you. And so you've made yourself primary. And then you've directed them in ways that they don't try to outthink and overthink you. They're always waiting for you. And now you're in a position where you're thinking about retirement, you're thinking about succession, and you have no clue what that looks like. But the point that I'm making for you all is your ability to engineer, your ability to engineer teamship 